One of the most interesting prospects in astrobiology is the idea of looking for the gases of life in the atmospheres of exoplanets rather than the signs of alien civilizations. The reason for this is that we know there has been a detectable alien civilization on this world for about a hundred years, maybe a bit longer. Any aliens that might spot our civilization would need to be very close to even have a chance of seeing us. But as to the biosphere itself, essentially the plants have been visible for billions of years, long enough for the entire galaxy to know life itself is here. This has led scientists to look into thinking about just what chemistry we should look for with the James Webb Space Telescope to try to nail down an exoplanet biosphere. But the problem with a lot of the proposed biosignature gases identified thus far is that they can be a bit ambiguous, and while life may produce them, other processes might as well. This has led to the thinking that we should try to identify as many potential alien biologically produced gases as we can to have a greater profile in what we can use JWST to look for, though this one is not ideal. While Webb can do infrared observations in mid-infrared that you need to see these gases, it's just starting and coming. Ground-based telescopes will be better and should shed more light on these biosignatures. But it is in principle possible for Webb's near-spec instrument to pick this up using the transit method as the planet passes in front of its host star. Two recent papers have put two more biosignature options on the table. The first, done by UCR research team, involves a process known as methylation. It's widespread on Earth and is used by many plants, including broccoli, to dispose of toxins by converting them into gases. How this happens is that the plant attaches a carbon atom and three hydrogen atoms to the toxin, often a heavy metal, ostensibly converting it to a gas that can then harmlessly float away. This is interesting because some of these gases would be very distinctive and unlikely to be created by anything but life. One of these is methyl bromide, and it's somewhat short-lived, so if you see it, it's being replenished, and therefore the most likely source for it would be life rather than small amounts puffed out by volcanoes. An advantage, though, is that there is a cousin biosignature here, which is methyl chloride. This makes for an unequivocal detection, or at least gets into that territory, when you can see both signatures together, rather than just one. The drawback here is that while Earth has plenty of methyl bromide, it's not easily detectable from afar. Ultimately, due to the sun's intense UV light starting chemical reactions that break up water molecules whose constituents react with the methyl bromide. But if you have a different type of star, a red dwarf for example, this should be less of a problem, as their UV profiles are different from the sun and would have less of this effect by a factor of four. There are other possibilities here in regards to methylation. There may be other gases produced in this manner that might be detectable, and this team looks to continue to catalogue them all. This particularly exciting group of potential signatures of life may end up being major considerations of future instrumentation designed to search for biosignatures. And there is another interesting astrobiological feature here. Methylation is so common on Earth, and such a convenient chemical way to dispose of toxins, that it might be very common in the universe at large. If so, given the variety of products of this process, if you saw these gases in exoplanet atmospheres, it would give at least a vague profile of the biochemistry going on in that world. Perhaps tiny clues revealing bits and pieces of what that biosphere may be like. The next biosignature has thus far been somewhat overlooked, even after being one of the more famous gases we use in human civilization. It's nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, and a team led by Eddie Schweitzerman of the University of California has recently published a paper that suggests we should probably pay more attention to this gas as a potential biosignature. On Earth, nitrous oxide is a waste byproduct of life, Microbial life especially can convert nitrogen compounds into nitrates, which releases energy for metabolism. This process is extremely important for larger plants, 
as the microorganisms can fix atmospheric nitrogen into the soil essentially as a fertilizer. There are even plants, such as various beans, that live in symbiotic relationships with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. On the other hand, some microorganisms feed on nitrates, the byproduct of which is nitrous oxide. This should be evident in exoplanet atmospheres, and again, should in principle be detected by mid-infrared by JWST. Schweitemann and team looked into the promising TRAPPIST-1 system for clues. A system only 39 light-years away, and within JWST's wheelhouse. It turns out that a planet in that system would have levels similar to carbon dioxide here on Earth, so a relatively small concentration. The problem is potentially that Earth's life doesn't produce that much nitrous oxide relative to carbon dioxide. At the same time, though, it's thought that the levels of nitrous oxide in Earth's atmosphere has fluctuated significantly across different geologic periods, such as after the Great Oxygenation event, where the levels should have been much higher. That's an interesting idea. If you see high levels of nitrous oxide in an exoplanet's atmosphere, does it reflect a more primitive biosphere, or simply a radically different one than our current atmospheric situation here on Earth? especially accounting for oxygen levels thought to have existed at that time. That alone could answer one of the great filters. Does microbial life leap to complex life easily, or is it much more chance-based? If you saw an old exoplanet with the atmosphere of a young Earth, you might be able to surmise that most life in the universe is primitive and stuck at the level of the small. Also in this is that nitrous oxide suffers from the same problem as methylated bromine, in that it gets broken down by the parent star, so detecting this once again is most likely at a red dwarf system. The good news is that studying exoplanets in red dwarf systems, by far the most common type of star in the universe, happens to be the easiest ones for transits. But also present with nitrous oxide, which can be produced by lightning, is nitrogen dioxide, which is also produced in a predictable way. If you see both of those gases, you could safely conclude that an exoplanet has lightning, which is interesting in and of itself. Seeing just nitrous oxide in disequilibrium, and it moves into the territory of life. And within this lies something else exciting. By studying exoplanet atmospheres for potential biogenic gases, we are now creating a palette of them that we can search for. There are also technosignature gases as well, such as CFCs, that not only destroy ozone layers, but are also extremely good greenhouse gases for terraforming. However, in studying a mixed profile of gases in a potentially inhabited exoplanet's atmosphere, we should be able to make a more convincing case than any one single gas detection could. If you see odd levels and the presence of methylated chemicals, along with methane, weird oxygen levels, nitrous oxide, certain sulfur compounds and so on, you may be looking at another Earth. What's also important here are the disequilibriums. If you see gases that might normally be present in nature and don't necessarily reflect a biosphere, the individual levels of them might. If you see too much of a gas for the conditions of the exoplanet you're observing, reactive gases that are being replenished more than nature would reasonably do, you could make a good case for a biosphere. The more possible disequilibriums we know about, the greater our chances of detecting an alien biosphere. It's also worth noting that JWST has already begun observations of the TRAPPIST-1 system, and there have been some preliminary observations and reports of data, but much more is to be expected when the researchers publish the results of their observations. Very interesting times indeed, and if we can't discover an alien civilization easily, maybe we can find a garden world. Thanks for listening. I am not the futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, but I am currently covering for him while he recovers from Ankylese fever. And is it the total mercy of an opossum in a smock? I tell you, it is very hard reading in his register. 
and be sure to check out his books and subscribe to these channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird and amazing universe in which we live. <laughs> Number two. And now, time for the credits. Oh, I don't think I was supposed to read that. John, do I read the credits? No? It says now time for the credits. Is that part of the script or is that a direction? Yeah, John's really ill this week, actually. He's quite poorly. He was really, one, he was really looking forward to doing the end of year video and doing a bit of funny stuff at the end, you know, like he likes to do. But unfortunately, he's got... I don't know what's wrong with him. He's not very well, so he's... Uh, he can't talk, but... Um, and obviously John's John's voice is his brand, so but he will probably edit the video, so I best be I best behave myself. I wonder if he'll edit this out.